Good afternoon. There you go. It's always the technology companies who have technology problems. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I know this is the graveyard shift, the last session effectively of the last day. And when I was looking at where the trusted AI stage, the trusted AI panel is uh, during this uh, InnoFest Unbound, on the one hand, I think it's fantastic that we're here having this conversation. Um, we're certainly getting a huge amount of interest from companies, from governments, from society as a whole about responsible and trusted AI. But my hope for next year is that we don't have a trusted AI stage, that really this is something that every presentation, everyone who's talking about AI systems and technology as a whole is taking up. So we're not going to have a trusted AI stage next year, I hope. It's going to be right on the main stage as a centerpiece of all of the discussions that we're having. What I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about um, Microsoft's journey and our thinking on the responsible use of artificial intelligence. Last year, um, our president and chief legal officer and our head of AI and research put out this book, The Future Computed, which really set out our thinking on this question of how AI can be developed, deployed and used in society in a responsible way. And really one of the key ideas that this book was getting across is this, this concept that really the key thing we need to be asking ourselves is ultimately not just what computers and technology systems can be doing, but what is it that they should be doing. And part of our answer to that question was setting out the six core principles that we've been applying to our own development and deployment of artificial in intelligence technologies. The first, fairness, uh, that we're very cautious uh, about the potential for AI systems in some cases if data is not appropriately used in training models to exacerbate existing discrimination in society. Really that AI systems um, should not be deployed in ways that we wouldn't be comfortable or even that would be legal for human behaviour to, to discriminate against certain groups within the population. Reliability and safety, as we've asked time and time again with many new technologies from the automotive on, what are the standards that need to be developed, the practices that need to be developed to ensure that this, te this technology is used in a reliable and safe manner. On privacy and security, really the key question that we've been trying to get at here is, as the technology world has come to embrace these as central concepts of trust in the use of technology more widely, what are some of the new questions we need to be asking to ensure that individuals' personal privacy is protected, to ensure that cybersecurity is protected through the use of artificial intelligence technologies? And, and the fourth specific principle of inclusiveness, when AI technologies are being used, how can we make sure that they're being deployed in a way that optimises the opportunities to bring everyone in society into the benefits of technology to the economy and society as a whole? And then two cross-cutting principles. Transparency, which I'll talk more about uh, in detail, uh, is, is really a, a key principle uh, that cuts across all of the others. And then accountability. This fundamental question of, as AI systems are used more and more, how can we ensure that ultimately it's humans that are responsible, especially for consequential decisions that are being made that affect individuals? So what I want to do today, rather than talk about all of those principles, is focus on just one, which is on transparency. As I mentioned, this is one of the two cross-cutting principles we identified that run across all of the, the various scenarios we can think of in which AI is being developed and deployed. Transparency has a fundamental link with fairness. We need to understand what is in a data set. Does it have a particular skew or bias um, that then might affect the way in which that model is deployed? It, it clearly affects reliability, safety, privacy, security. We need to know how systems are being deployed that uh, are in keeping with those principles. And, and on issues like inclusiveness, we need to have more transparent conversations about ensuring that this technology uh, is used in a way that maximizes those opportunities to include everyone in society. And also, when we look at the Singapore AI model governance framework, um, transparency is something that cuts across all of the four main areas of, of Singapore's framework that has been issued. In terms of internal governance structures and the kinds of procedures that companies put in place, the, the kind of transparency that happens between different groups within a company uh, through governance mechanisms on how these technologies are, are being used. 
clearly down at the bottom, customer relationship management is all about transparency. How, how are companies engaging with those who are interacting with artificial intelligence technologies or are affected by their use? But it's also in way very important to other aspects that we might not immediately think of. When organisations are determining the kind of AI decision making model, the extent to which a human should be in the loop or over the loop or the other options that were set out in the framework, having transparency about the way in which an AI system works, the kinds of impacts that might be generated by it, is incredibly important in making that decision about the decision making model. And then many of the issues on operations management that were discussed in the model framework on the way in which a data model works, training works for an AI system, transparency is very important for making informed decisions on that. And what I want to do is talk through three examples of technologies and issues that we've been working on at Microsoft and the way in which transparency is related to each of those four aspects of Singapore's model framework. The first of these that I want to talk about is facial recognition. This is a technology that um, is obviously in the headlines a lot. Uh, it's one that we have done a lot of work on. There are huge potential benefits from the use of facial te recognition technologies. Uh, early trials of facial recognition in New Delhi, for example, that in three days managed to spot 4,000 missing children who otherwise would not have been found in a city like Delhi. The use of facial recognition as part of medical diagnosis, where a human doctor is not able to spot subtle changes in a person's face that can be an indicator of particular types of disease. So there are huge opportunities and positive benefits from this technology, but we're also very mindful of the risks that exist. And so that's why we started to talk in a transparent and very public manner uh, around mid last year about some of these challenges, about how societies can be getting the right balance between the challenges and opportunities presented through facial recognition. And what that led to is, towards the end of last year, us issuing six principles um, that we are applying to our own use and deployment and development of facial recognition technology. Some of these are really echoing and putting into the specific context of facial recognition those broad principles that I described before, like fairness, like accountability, like transparency. But also we've called out what we think some of the specific challenges are for facial recognition. For example, in terms of its potential to be used for surveillance, um, that we, we've called out this as being an area where we think governments need to be affording legal protections to individuals to ensure that there's not ongoing surveillance of individuals through facial recognition without a, a lawful order to, to uh, authorise that kind of technology. And that's something we've been very publicly engaged on, especially in recent months or in non-discrimination. Um, we've been flowing this through into our uh, online services terms that we, will, we are requiring the end users of this technology um, to be ensuring that they adhere to laws that exist on non-discrimination, that there isn't a, a sort of trap that they fall into of thinking they can avoid those existing uh, legal obligations that they face. And then what we've done more recently in March this year is issue specific guidance uh, relating to face API, which is one of the main building blocks for facial recognition that we've developed, that guide developers and those that are making decisions on the use of this technology on really what, what this system is, what are its capabilities and what are some of its limitations, providing transparency on how that face API works so that those who are using this, uh, the system owners, can make really informed choices. It goes into detail on issues like accuracy and what that means in the context of facial recognition systems. It also underlines the importance of not relying purely on a facial recognition system alone uh, where it's not appropriate to do so. So to be thinking about facial recognition as part of an AI system that goes beyond that technology uh, and thinking about the wider role of a human in the decision-making process, what's the wider environment that it exists in. Uh, and of course, this is related to issues like accuracy. One thing that facial recognition systems are not very good at, uh, say in a security camera context, is dis distinguishing between a photo of a face that's held up to a camera and the actual face. And so that's where uh, the kind of example we've called out in this transparency note of where it's important for a trained security guard to also have a role in reviewing the output from that facial recognition system. 
So on facial recognition, how hopefully I've explained, uh, in terms of this key concept of transparency, how we've flowed through from a broad discussion on some of the societal implications of facial recognition, the specific principles we're uh, employing on this to some of the specific technical guidance that we've issued. The second example that I wanted to call out is on chatbots, um, conversational AI. I think many of us, if not all of us, are increasingly interacting with chatbots on a daily basis. Uh, and we're seeing customers adopting our conversational AI technology across such a wide range of industries, from sport to retail to insurance to other technology companies. We might not think that this is something that has as consequential impacts as facial recognition, but we do think it's a technology where responsibility and trust questions need to be asked as well. And so in that context, again, we've taken the approach of issuing public guidelines that apply uh, for conversational, for the responsible use of conversational AI for chatbots. I won't run through all of these in detail. And again, you can see that some of this is about translating those broad principles for the ethical, responsible deployment of AI overall into the specific context of chatbots. But we've also called out and provided specific guidance to developers and users of our conversational AI technology on how issues like misuse um, can, can present risks uh, and, and that the use of the system needs to be limited in a way that restricts that. That if the role of a chatbot is to be responding to an order for pizza, it probably shouldn't be providing answers to political jokes about presidents and prime ministers. So this, this approach we've taken is one that we think is valuable to the developer community, to users of this system in framing how chatbot technology can be used responsibly. And this is also complemented with some of the technical tools we've made available through our bot framework. For example, on offensive text classifiers or some of the technology um, through our Azure machine learning platform uh, that's available for traceability to help identify where something might have gone wrong in the use of these systems. So facial recognition, chatbots, and then the final example I wanted to give is not about a specific technology as the other two are, but about something that's cutting across and is relevant to all um, AI uh, systems. And this is a key question that's being asked increasingly and a concern that's developing about the so-called black box nature of some AI systems, that one of, not the only, but one of the important ways of overcoming those concerns is through greater transparency on the data sets that are used in training AI models. Some of the thinking that we've been giving to this and the conversations we've been driving come from a Microsoft research project that resulted in this paper published last year and, and a series of conversations around that on the concept of data sheets for data sets. And this is the idea, uh, really trying to translate an idea that's come from the hardware side of the technology industry and other industries that there is a common set of documentation that's provided for, thing, for, for IT components, where all, uh, those, uh, all in industry who are responsible for uh, developing those products are using a common set of criteria and common language to describe the function of specific pieces of hardware. And so what these researchers at, uh, through this Microsoft Research Project have called out is why not take the same approach for the data sets that are used in AI training models? to be coming up with common questions that can really enable informed choices by developers and users of this technology um, to be aware of some of the potential lim limitations of the data sets used. And what we're really pleased with now is this is flowing through into a wider conversation in the technology industry and beyond the technology industry on this issue. Through the partnership on AI, which is something that Microsoft and a number of other companies founded last year, a project was launched in April, uh, the About ML initiative, that is really getting at this issue. How can there be a more standardized process to providing transparency of the data sets that are used in AI models? So hopefully I've given a, a, a sense there of how that one of the six principles that Microsoft is applying uh, to the responsible development of AI is relevant and how that's linked to the issues called out in Singapore's model framework. The question then, what are we going to do next? Well, I think the first thing that it's really important to emphasize is we're not declaring victory on any of those other things that I've just spoken about. These are very difficult issues and we're fully aware that conversations, processes will need to go on for many years uh, on, on how to ensure the trustworthy, responsible, ethical deployment, development of those technologies. 
But what will we be doing in future? We'll be continuing to work on those and other areas related to our responsible AI principles. We'll be engaging more in uh, global, regional processes, cross-industry initiatives like the Partnership on AI. We'll continue engaging with governments uh, around the region and around the world on these issues. But what I wanted um, to call out today uh, is a new initiative that we're announcing today, um, which is looking specifically at some of the challenges and opportunities in the financial services industry on how to translate principles on the responsible use of AI into practice, how to operationalize some of the guidelines that have been issued, like the Monetary Authority of Singapore's FEAT guide or the Model AI governance framework from Singapore, how to translate those into practice. So what we're going to be doing with the initial launch partners of Deutsche Bank, which is obviously a global bank that's very active in Asia, and Linklater is a global law firm uh, that's leading both on technology and financial services, and with our own team, is looking at the different contexts in financial services in which some of these questions like fairness, accountability, transparency, and others are raised. Uh, and seeing across those different contexts, what are some of the different issues raised? There are different responsible AI questions that come up, say, in an investment banking scenario to uh, giving financial advice to an individual or a lending decision to an individual. And we think this is really where the rubber hits the road in terms of responsible AI. It's in those specific contexts that we need to be thinking. So that's something we're, we're very excited to be announcing today. And at the Singapore FinTech Festival in November, we'll be publishing some of the findings from that initiative. Thanks very much for your time. The Trusted AI session, the last one on the last day. And I look forward to us not having this stage, as I said, next year, and to be having Trusted AI as one of the core um, discussions that we're having on the main stage in every AI presentation next year. Thanks very much. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, any question from the floor? Okay, uh, over there. Hi. Uh, so my question is around uh, accountability. Uh, so uh, basically, um, the question would be, since we are calling uh, for a cloud provider that we can call a AI uh, API for, um, how exactly would the liabilities flow? What, sorry. How would li liabilities flow, basically, in the event of uh, a problem with the cloud-based AI, uh, AI system? So uh, I'll give you a more concrete example. For example, um, identification, uh, some kind of um, um, vision-based identification system for people and inability to uh, identify other races than the standard you know, uh, races. Those liabilities, how, how basically would the startup, which basically builds the service, be the person liable, or will this flow over to uh, somehow flow over to the APIs that were created since the APIs were basically a cloud service provider API? Thanks very much. It's a great question. Look, liability is one of those issues that we singled out last year in this future computed publication as an important area for much more work. We think that. At a, at a fundamental level, this is one where there is a strong existing legal basis to work on, where there's been a lot of case law that's built up on these questions for the software industry more broadly, and where those sorts of questions have, have been tackled before. So it needs more work and more discussion to understand what's different in the context of AI technologies. But our starting point is that's one where we can really build on, on the existing case law legislation that's existed, and kind of the core principle there that would generally apply is that it is the organization that's deployed that technology. It's the user, uh, it's, it's, it's that user of the technology, uh, if I can put it that way, that is going to be the one who has the responsibility. Thank you very much, Marcus. Yeah, could you join me in, oh, just one. So you mentioned in your talk, you in your terms, you have like, uh, you the user should adhere to, stand to like ethical standards when they use your APIs, right? So is Microsoft kind of enforcing these standards? Like what happens if a user you doesn't follow these standards when they're um, applying the, when they're using your APIs? Do you, are there tools that kind of flag them and give them warning because they're in your terms and conditions? Yeah, look, it's a really important question. I think the specific example I was giving was about ensuring that, uh, that those who are using uh, some of our specific AI technologies 
ensure that uh, they're not using that for unlawful discrimination and that being built specifically into our services terms. Now, I think this is a question where ultimately it can't be one that's solved by one company. Um, there is a risk that if one company moves ahead, if there isn't an industry-wide approach to developing that relationship between some of the developers of AI technologies and the organisations using them, there's a risk potentially of a race to the bottom or there's a risk of things slipping between the cracks. So that is something that's going to need to be a, a much wider and longer conversation. But it is something where on that specific example I gave, we have, we have done what we can to build that into the responsibility between us and, and those who are using our technology.